Good morning, welcome to Allied for Action. Uh, it's a pleasure again to co-sponsor the annual conference with the Minnesota Council on Foundations and to be here with Bill King. On behalf of the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits and the Minnesota Council on Foundations, I'd like to welcome you to our fourth joint annual conference. This is the only place in the country where nonprofits and foundations get together on a regular basis. I'm John Pratt, Executive Director of the Council of Nonprofits, and I'm pleased to be welcoming 1,300 nonprofit leaders uh, together. Thank you, all of you, and presenters, especially those who made the trip from far reaches of the state and from nearby states. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Joint Conference Planning Committee, whose members are listed in your program. Uh, Brad Cruz and Eloisa Echevez chaired the Conference Planning Committee. Uh, Eloise and Brad, wherever you are, uh, please know that we thank you for your work. Also, annual conference committees, let's give them a thank you for everyone who helped plan this. Also, a key group, I'd like to acknowledge the staff of MCN and MCF, uh, many of them who are still outside helping registration, uh, but please know that we appreciate your amazing hosting and organizational skills. Let's also give them a round of applause. I want to give a few updates on uh, the nonprofit economy uh, and some election related issues uh, before we start our program. Uh, each year, the Council of Nonprofits issues a nonprofit economy report tracking so what has happened over the previous year. Certainly, a lot of issues around the recession. Uh, the way we look at the economy partly is there are three parts business, government, and nonprofits. Nonprofits make up about 12% of the state's economy, 12% of the state's workforce. We track the number of organizations and the number of employees. Here you can see we also track uh, employment locations. Uh, one of the developments you can see since 2008, the number of nonprofits with employees has reduced slightly. It's now 3,500, had been up to 3,800. Uh, but the number of employment locations, so nonprofits have more places where they're providing services. Some of the organizations that dropped off went out of business. Some of them are, have moved to an all volunteer status. Also, important set of organizations. Uh, for looking at the overall employment, uh, now it's up to 298,000 people work in the larger nonprofit sector. Uh, one question we get uh, often is, well, how much of this is really sort of the hospitals, the higher education, sort of these really giant nonprofits? Uh, so we've separated that out from the rest. Uh, and so this is that smaller number now without hospitals or higher education, still a very substantial part of the state's workforce, 7%. What's interesting is, and there's at your tables are some sort of uh, nonprofit economy update. Uh, but as you look at this, you can see th the recession uh, didn't really drop nonprofit employment uh, in that 2008 to 2010 period, whereas the business sector dropped 130,000 jobs, dropped about 6%. Nonprofits turn out to be a very stable part of the economy uh, and help, or, and certainly demand goes up for many nonprofit services in a time of a recession, but fortunately they proved to be very resilient. Uh, we also look at at uh, compensation uh, in different ways. Uh, this is looking at compensation uh, comparing nonprofits to government uh, to the for-profit sector. Uh, you can see over the last 10 years there's been some compression, which is a good thing. Uh, there is a wage gap between what nonprofit employees get paid and other employees in the economy. Uh, so this is sort of a uh, and we would make the argument that there's no economic justification why people doing the same work uh, in different kinds of organizations should be paid differently. Uh, so the good news is nonprofits both have very high levels of benefits, uh, actually often better than in the for-profit sector, uh, and now are starting to close the gap uh, with for-profit and government employers in wages. Uh, every two years we do a salary and benefit survey, uh, and that is also showing sort of similar compression uh, and some improvements over, uh, over inflation. So which is, uh, I, I think, as responsible employers uh, and as important parts of the economy, we want to see nonprofits to thrive in this uh, and to be sustainable. That was subject of a presentation last night at the CEO trustee dinner, uh, and I think is part of a lot of the conversations today. Uh, obviously, everyone knows that 
Uh, the election is next Tuesday. Uh, this is the closest we've ever had one of these conferences to the election. Uh, many nonprofits have participated in get out the vote efforts, uh, voter education efforts. Minnesota tends to be at the top end of voter turnout and voter participation, and we're also at the top end of nonprofit activity, uh, philanthropy, corporate contributions, and volunteering. Uh, and certainly those things go together. Nonprofits are trusted uh, advisors and colleagues for people in the community, uh, and we've been working with many of your organizations to help get out the vote, including people who are, are in underrepresented constituencies. Uh, this year is different too, in that there are several constitutional amendments uh, that the nonprofit sector has also been very active in. Minnesota Council of Nonprofits opposes both of these amendments. Uh, the lead campaign against the marriage ban is being, it's being led by really an extraordinary organizing effort. Uh, and I also want to say hats off to Sheila Smith with Minnesota Citizens for the Arts, who's done a lot of the outreach into the nonprofit sector as well. Uh, at our participation project uh, display, there's a list of both organizations that have taken a position on the marriage amendment, opposing it. Uh, and also uh, another nonprofit, Our Vote, Our Future, which is opposing the photo ID amendment. So as, as a membership organization, we know not all organizations and certainly not all people in the state agree. Minnesota works best when people are able to set aside their differences and work together, uh, not solely to look at um, sort of taking positions on issues and then not talking to the other side. Uh, so I think one of the healthy things that's happened over the last year has been conversations within communities about how these amendments affect people. Uh, and we certainly want to work together in the future across the nonprofit sector and MCN values all of its members and 2,000 organizations. The, uh, actually, Susie Brown is leading a session after this, uh, talking about the constitutional amendments. It's very possible we're going to see more constitutional amendments in the future and more discussion of the nonprofit role in dealing with important issues like this affecting the state. Finally, I would like to encourage you to take full advantage of the conference by networking, visiting with exhibitors, asking experts burning questions, and learning and interacting in breakout sessions. This is great to have 1,300 people together. This is our biggest uh, event of the year and a good opportunity to participate both with the exhibitors. I talked to someone who said uh, they're putting their audit out to bid. They were able to find all the potential bidders right here in the exhibit hall. And, of course, there's also an exhibit hunt. So thanks again so much for being here, and I'm going to turn it over to Bill King. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, John. Let me add my welcome on behalf of the Minnesota Council on Foundations to all 1,300 of you. This is always a great opportunity for us um, as the nonprofit sector in total, grant makers and nonprofit organizations coming together for important purposes. Um, I'm going to uh, start with just a couple of recognitions and then I'll um, have a couple of comments about the Minnesota Council on Foundations and the work that we're doing in the next uh, three years. But what I want to do is recognize that this conference does not happen without generous sponsors. And so there has been over $100,000 contributed by sponsors to make this conference available to everyone here and to keep the pricing of the conference um, reasonable so that many, many people can participate. I want to just take a couple minutes to recognize those that have given $7,500 or more. And they are the Bremer Bank, the Design Company, In Commons, Medtronic Foundation, Minnesota Initiative Foundations, Mutual of America, Otto Bremer Foundation, the St. Paul Foundation Minnesota Philanthropy Partners, and travelers. Let's thank them for their generous support. <laughs> These kinds of events and the kind of work that both the Council on Foundations and the Council of Nonprofits do wouldn't happen without dedicated volunteers and in particular board members. So I would like to ask the board members of both councils to please stand and be recognized for your contributions to making this sector strong and whole as we go forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. 
I wanted to share with you that as um, our members know, the Minnesota Council on Foundations just adopted an ambitious strategic plan last December called Leadership for the Future 2012 to 2014. And in it, we recognize that with all the sectors of society and our economy redefining direction and role, MCF also had to factor in its thinking important roles that it can play um, to work with members, nonprofits, and the community on how to navigate the uncertain future that we are in. What they affirmed was that we were going to continue to be a member um, organization that did a combination of service and leadership and really focused on the leadership. We will continue to do the work that we've always done well and have been respected for on providing education, information, and networking opportunities for our members and the constituents that we work with that are close to our members. But in these times, we really knew we had to make bigger commitments and go deeper on a couple of specific issues um, going forward. The first issue that we're really diving into deeply, and we have had a history of doing work here, is on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, in taking that on, our members are particularly concerned about and want to act on um, the issues of disparities in our communities and how we do work in that area. Um, those disparities occur generally in the areas that they're making grants, education, health care, um, and so forth, employment. So we'll be looking at ways in the next three years to really dig deeper and do more work with our members and alongside our members to address those um, disparities. Um, we won't just look at the community, though. We'll also look at philanthropy itself. Um, we'll be looking at leadership and governance in philanthropy and trying to figure out how we can help um, these member organizations um, increase equitable outcomes in communities by changing the diversity and inclusion of their organizations. So that's one. The second one um, is also uh, closely related to the disparities issues, but it's the issues that John just talked about that we're so proud of the Council of Nonprofits on taking its positions. And that's, we have had a strong history of working on federal issues um, and primarily on tax law, incentives or disincentives for philanthropy. But we recognize in today's world, with everything changing, the roles for government changing, nonprofits and philanthropy, we have to engage more in state public policy issues. Again, we'll focus in areas where grant makers are largely making their grants, similar areas that I just mentioned with education, healthcare, workforce, employment types of issues, and figuring out um, where we go as an organization. And, Quite frankly, uh, we've got Susie on our committee and we look to the Council of Nonprofits and its long um, and successful history of doing this work to help us bring our grant making community more to the table at the state level. Many of them are already there and we wanna encourage more of that work. So both pieces are works in progress um, and work that we will be undertaking over the next couple of years. Um, next, I'd like to talk about MCF's um, research. Um, John just gave the nonprofit economy report we just issued about two weeks ago, giving in Minnesota report that talks about 2010 giving. And just this week we issued our top grant maker lists, corporate, family, and community foundations. The 2010 data shows that we're in recovery, but it's really slow recovery. Um, we have about a 2.6% overall increase in giving. It includes individuals as well as corporations and foundations. The individual giving actually went up 3.4%, which is a great news story for us. Um, and corporate foundation and giving went up 0.6%. The Looking at the 2011 data for just those top 50 foundations, we continue to see a rise in giving from corporations and foundations, and that's good. But we also have to temper that with the knowledge it's slow and steady. It's not returning to what it was before. We'll see what happens with the economy to go forward. I share both of these pieces of information about giving so that you have that expectation in your work, but I also wanna point out that we have one of the biggest um, opportunities coming up on November 15th with Give to the Max Day to really multiply that individual giving generosity and spirit. So we're excited to share with you that less than two weeks away until the Great Minnesota Give Together, um, there are new additional prize grants available that we want you to know about, and we want to encourage you to visit the Give Men booth for more information on how to make sure that your organization is actively participating and taking advantage of that. So a shout out to Dana Nelson and her crew um, at Give to the Max Day. And um, if, 
shameless promotion here. Uh, once Give to the Max Day is over and you're looking at your grant seeking needs, um, we want you to know that we've spent the last year updating our um, online searchable database that has the most up-to-date information on Minnesota grant makers called Minnesota Grant Makers Online. And during the conference, we're offering a $50 discount to those who um, enroll in Minnesota Grant Makers Online. So that concludes the comments on Minnesota Council on Foundations. I'm going to shift us to the uh, plenary session. And I want to introduce our moderator, Sandy Vargas, who's the president and CEO of the Minneapolis Foundation. Throughout her tenure, Sandy has been recognized as a leader in expanding business development opportunities for women and people of color, building cross-sector collaborations, streamlining business processes, and promoting strategies to increase individual self-efficiency and to strengthen community. Sandy's a great ally of nonprofits and foundations. Um, we were talking earlier that Sandy is sort of an interesting name right now. She's not quite the whirlwind, but close to what we saw on the East Coast. So please welcome Sandy. Well, I just want to say thank you to both Bill and John. Buenos dias. And it's great to be gathered here with so many friendly faces, old friends, and new allies. I first want to just comment on the title of this conference and say that Allied for Action, what a great title for this conference. But the most important part is bridging differences for the greater good. We know that we need to move our alliances together now more than ever. And as John talked about the constitutional amendments and other kinds of issues that are going on in our community, we have to work together. None of us can do it alone. And one of the things that I think is important about the whole concept about of civil discourse and looking at the future of Minnesota is how do we start thinking deeply together about the issue that Bill brought up, which was the issue of disparities. All of you know, as I know, that we have some of the most tremendous disparities here in the Twin Cities in the country. Whether it's African American men, whether it's the achievement gap that our kids are struggling and suffering through, or whether it's religious bigotry. So that's something that we need to keep in mind as we think about how we not only take the information from today, our learning, but how do we implement our learning? How do we get into deep conversation and most of all, action to start addressing some of these issues that are going to stop the economic engine that the Twin Cities in Minnesota is, not only for this state, but for this country. Well, I'm pleased to now get us started for the reason that we're all gathered this morning. Today, we have three nationally known thought leaders who will challenge us to rethink our long-term strategies for engaging stakeholders and for serving communities. You know, sometimes I wanna bring up the issue of, um, you know, we are the charitable sector, but the word charity just doesn't fit the work we do. That's not the business we're in anymore as far as I'm concerned. We are in partnerships, we're in work together, we're in strategies that we're developing. We have to come together to develop a common agenda. And so I think that these three talks that we're going to hear will help us um, really think about the new Minnesota. Each of our speakers is gonna spend about 10 minutes, it's a little like the TED Talks, in challenging us on some of the ways that we can think about the way that Minnesota is changing in terms of economics, demographics, and politics, so that we as the nonprofit sector can think about how do we change our roles? How do we promote healthy civil discourse and achieve a collective vision for the new Minnesota? And so now I want to uh, welcome Nate Garvis, Paul Schmitz, and Lori Soroya to join me as we enter in to this discussion. 
Nate Garvis, and many of you know Nate, um, is the founder and president of Na Naked Civics, an innovative public affairs consultancy focusing on social innovation, design, and counsel. Prior to creating Naked Civics, Nate served as vice president of government affairs for the Target Corporation. Please join me in welcoming Nate Garvis. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Sandy. Morning, everybody. Well, let's see here if this pickle works. I uh, hope everybody's doing well. Okay, so we're living in a fast-changing world, a world of ambiguity, and um, we all want to produce value. We all want to produce healthy outcomes for our communities. In order to produce value, I oftentimes think of it, and actually, uh, it's a duality. It's a, a two-step move. We have to be responsive, but we also have to be relevant. And I want to actually talk about the relevant side of it as we move into Paul and Lori's conversations, which are really about how we respond to this. But relevance is really um, about making sure that we are thinking about our issues uh, in a grounded way, that we are outcome focused in addition to input focused, because we don't want to hit the wrong targets with amazing accuracy. And that happens a lot, right? So I want to um, start off by grounding us uh, in um, this number, eight. The reason why I came up with eight is because I'm not smart enough to get to 10, okay? <laughs> no, there are, there are, the reason why I come up with eight is that I believe that there are eight outcomes, eight outcomes that we all desire in our community, eight outcomes that we all need in order to be uh, able to say that we live in a healthy community. We all agree on these things. We all want to live in a community where you feel safe. We all want to live in a community where more people than not experience good health. We all need to live in communities where there are opportunities to be productive. We all want to live in a community where there's opportunity for innovation and inspiration. We all want to live in communities where we can pass on knowledge and wisdom. We all want to live in communities where we can be compensated for our activities. We want to live in communities where there's good infrastructure, not just built, but preserved as well. And then finally, we all want to live in communities where there's morality and justice. Those are the eight grounding outcomes that we all agree on. We all agree that we want that to happen, and every one of you in this audience, in some way, shape, or form, is working on one, and oftentimes more than one, of those issues. Question is, what are the natures of, of, this, of these issues in front of us? And then, of course, how do we go about uh, moving on the relevance of this? Well, one of the things to understand about this eight is that we oftentimes think about them as problems. And problems are something that you fix. One of the problems with that is that when we fix problems, usually what we're doing is we're affixing our approach. These problems actually aren't problems. These problems are actually dilemmas. A dilemma is a problem that never gets solved. You never put a fork in it and say, it's over. You and I will never ever live in a safe community. Hopefully, we will live in safer communities. And that's an ongoing journey. It would actually take a crime to make your community crime free. And uh, we don't want to be engaged in any of that. What we need to be doing is addressing all of these dilemmas as ongoing journeys, ongoing activities that we approach with actually something that I call our toolbox. Now, it's oftentimes easy for us to think of tools as technology, and all of you use technology out there. But our world is full of much bigger designs than just our technology. Our world is full of some of the biggest designs of all, which is our institutions. Every one of you is, is attached to an institutional form, something that was designed. We oftentimes don't think of where we work as a place that was designed, but every one of you works for an entity that had to be created. And the reason why I think that's important to talk about in this relevance thing is that if you understand that what you're working within is a design, it gives you the freedom to redesign. And this world is screaming for redesign right now. We don't want to live in an unregulated world. We know what that looks like on the planet. We need to be working in a re-regulating world. 
And one of the things I like to focus on is regulating our world well beyond the world of law and politics. Our world of law and politics is full of professionally ticked off people working in distinctly adversarial situations, right? And here's the thing too, and this happens little p and big p as well, is that inherently it's a, it's a uh, solution adverse uh, environment. Because if I solve your problem, you don't need me anymore. And we get caught up in that a lot. But that's not the world that you work in. That's not the world you want to work in. One of the ways to get beyond that is really twofold. One is to understand that what we're working on are not problems, they're dilemmas. Two is that you can't go it alone. It's going to take collaboration. I can't think of a, uh, an issue out there that is so simple that it could take one tool to fix it. We actually have to use all of our tools together. We do this not just by producing laws, and I applaud you for focusing on the legislative arena. My plea to you is don't just focus on the legislative arena. It's an important place to be, and it's important that it not be the only place where people see you. And of course, that's not the case with you. You're seen everywhere. Be seen in collaboration. My, um, my uh, attitude really is that strategic collaborations these days are the competitive edge. You are out there laboring every day to make my community better. You've done an amazing job to date. You really do deserve a tremendous amount of credit for the fact that I come from what I call the civic capital of the, of the country. We have civic infrastructure here that is quite remarkable. And that's not because any of one of you has done that on, a, uh, on your own. It's taken collaboration, but the nature of collaboration is changing these days. And you're going to hear more about that. But again, if we can ground ourselves in the relevance of these eight things that we agree on, if we can agree on eight dilemmas, then we'll be less disagreeable as we disagree on the problems that we want to fix. And Paul will be talking about how we actually go about ar around the work of effective disagreement without being disagreeable with each other. We need a new leadership culture as we approach these dilemmas and uh, I look forward to uh, working with all of you uh, throughout this morning and into the future of my community on uh, how we go about the most important work of all, making our communities more prosperous, more healthy, more enjoyable for all of us to live in. Thanks. That's you now. Are you next? Thank you, Nate. Um, those are some interesting ideas, and I think that three of the themes that I picked up from what you just said was the question of relevance. Are we making sure that we're focused in on relevance? Uh, we can't do it alone. We have to do it through collaboration. And that we have an amazing civic infrastructure here in this community. And that we should take advantage of that. So let's hold our thoughts on that as people, uh, as we go to our next speakers. But think about the questions that you have for Nate as we go forward. So now we're going to, uh, next, we'll have uh, <clears throat> the pleasure of welcoming Paul Schmitz from Milwaukee. Paul is the author of Everyone Leads, Building Leadership from the Community Up. And, and he is also the national CEO of Public Allies, which has identified and developed, and I think this is the most amazing number, 4,400 diverse young leaders to strengthen communities, nonprofits, and civic participation. So, Paul, thank you for uh, joining us this morning, and we're interested in what you have to say about this topic. Thank you, everyone. Um, I live in Milwaukee, but I spend most of my time in Washington and New York. And a colleague called me and said he was coming to Milwaukee and wanted to have dinner with me. Uh, and that night, I, I was going to meet with him, and I called him to see where he I could pick him up. And it didn't make any sense to me because he was in Minneapolis. And I can tell you that I have had to, I'm sure for many of you, travel out east, the same thing happens. But I've had to explain to many people that our, our cities are actually about five, six hours apart. Uh, we're not part of the Twin Cities. Um, so my, uh, uh, first I just want to recognize Antonio Cardona, who runs Public Allies here in the Twin Cities. And we're very excited to have a program here uh, identifying and developing leaders from across uh, the community. So... Uh, what, I'd like to, what I'm going to talk about today is the idea that leadership is a muscle. And like any other muscle, it gets stronger with practice and exercise, and we all have it. 
And the reality is that first time you stepped up in your life, whether it was stepping up to a bully or on behalf of a friend, or when you stepped up to volunteer in some way on a cause you cared about, whatever that is, that's when you started building your leadership. And I'd like to open with a couple stories. The first is Biz Inesh Scott. Biz uh, was, when we met with her, she was an 18-year-old uh, single mother. Uh, she was on welfare and she was at community college. In her own words, she was a smart girl who had no idea of her potential. Her potential was incredible. Biz went on to college after doing a year of service, went to graduate school, went to law school, and most recently was one of the directors of presidential personnel at the White House. Most people don't think single mom in community college on welfare, White House lawyer. The second story is Peter Hoffel. Peter had a philosophy degree. He was 27 years old, and he was working at a deli, which meant that he could really name cool sandwiches. And Peter, one day, uh, a woman came in and asked him if she could hang a poster uh, for public allies in the deli. Uh, and Peter struck up a conversation and realized that he really wanted to make a difference. He said he would stay up late at night a lot with his friends, complaining and talking about social issues and politics, but never thought he could be part of the solution. Peter ended up finding, uh, during his year of service, he had a passion for people with disabilities, and today he's the CEO of the National Alliance for Mental Illness in Milwaukee and one of our state's leading disability rights advocates. And what we've done over 4,000 times is found that there is incredible leadership potential that's untapped in our communities. And there's all sorts of people who want to make a difference and don't know that they could be working with us, with our organizations, and that we're not doing enough to build that uh, leadership capacity that's out there in our communities. The reason why I'm so passionate about this is that's me. Uh, I was uh, someone who grew up uh, struggling with depression and addiction. I was institutionalized when I was 16. Uh, I was someone who, when I was, that photo was taken when I was 19, I was living on the streets. And so for me, I was actually a product of social services. There were nonprofits that helped my life, along with a lot of mentors. And as my life started coming together, I wanted to make a difference for others. And that's when I found Public Allies, and that's when I began a path that really, for me, is an unbelievable. I couldn't have imagined at that time all the twists and turns that would bring me to the point where I'm leading a network of almost 5,000 young leaders across the country and an advisor to the President of the United States. And so it's because of my own journey that I'm so passionate about the belief that, that we need to invest in the young leadership in our communities, especially those unlikely leaders, because that is where we'll get power to create change. We, we believe about leadership in three definitions that we think really encapsulate the kind of leadership we need today. The first is that leadership is an action everyone can take, not just a position that few people can hold. When we shift our thinking from leadership as a noun to a verb, we open up the possibilities of who can participate. And the reality is throughout our history, change has always come from the leadership of the many. An individual leader might spark something, but it takes leader, courageous leadership acts of many people to create change. And our first job as leaders is really to unleash the power of leadership throughout the people we work with. The second part of the definition is about taking responsibility because it's the essence of leadership. Leaders are not people who are blamers and complainers. Leaders are people who see a problem, are willing to do whatever it takes, and learn whatever they have to learn to be able to work on it and solve it. And because leadership is inherently a collaborative act, it's something we do with others. It has to be goals we hold in common with others. And the third part of the definition is what I'm going to talk about mostly today, which is what I think is the secret sauce, which is values. When we think about why people are cynical about leadership in our communities and our country, it's because of leaders who don't listen, who aren't interested in others' thoughts, who don't collaborate well, who don't practice what they preach. It's all about values. And, and one of the constructs I like to use to think about leadership comes from the U.S. Army. Their leadership manual is be, know, do. And the basic concept is, first I have to understand who am I as a leader? What's my vision? What's my mission? What are my values? What are my strengths? And how do I work well with others? And I have to master that before I gain the knowledge and the skills to achieve my mission. What I would argue is most leadership development on campuses and in communities focuses on knowledge and skills, and we don't focus on the B. Yet think about it. Are your biggest problems with other people that they don't have enough skills and competence or that they're pains in the butt to work with, right? And so we really do need to invest in building leadership values. And I'm going to offer five that I think are essential today. The first is about recognizing and mobilizing all of a community's assets. 
And I like to think of the proverbial glass. And Public Eyes has been rigorously studying this glass for about two decades. We've done randomized control samples and everything else. And we've come to the conclusion that the correct answer to the question, is the glass half empty and half full, is yes. <laughs> Every one of us is half empty and half full. And one of my colleagues from the early days of Public Allies and from the Asset Based Community Development Institute was Michelle Obama. And I just want to read a quote from her that I think really captures the essence of this value. We all have skills and talents that make us good friends, family members, workers, and leaders, and we also have needs and shortcomings that come along with those strengths. We can't do well serving these communities if we believe that we, the givers, are the only ones that are half full and that everyone we're serving is half empty. That has been the theme of my work in community my entire life, that there are assets and gifts out there in communities, and that our job as good servants and good leaders is not only just being humble, but it's having the ability to recognize those gifts in others and help them put those gifts into action. And I would argue that really is the secret sauce of leadership and the foundation of the other values. If we can get this right, we can really do so much more better. The second value is diversity and inclusion. And we look at, le at inclusion not as something that's passive, but as active. And there's a simple pass-fail test. We open up our eyes and ears and we explore, are we bringing all the right people around our tables? Do our tables reflect and represent the communities we serve? Are there any parts of our communities that don't feel engaged and invested and connected and accessible to us? And if we change who's at our table, we have to change the table itself. And that means we have to confront issues of power and privilege openly. And it also means we have to ensure that all the people at our table don't just feel that, they're, that, they're, that their culture is understood, but that there's a culture at our table that makes everyone feel valued and important. The third value is collaboration. And I look at collaboration really as about building trust. Because the reality is that if we bring, if we really are asset-based and look to see uh, and, and recognize others' assets, if we're inclusive and bring pe different people to the table, we're bringing that difference together means there's going to be conflict. We all have different leadership styles. Some of us are more visionaries. Some are analysts and focus on quality and execution. Some are mobilizers who, who can mobilize people to action and bring a sense of urgency. And some of us are nurturers who are great coaches and great at helping unleash others' potential. But the reality is a great team has all of that. But if we bring that difference together, there's going to be conflict. And the question is whether aware of our own style strengths and needs enough and we accept others enough and we've spent the time building trust where that conflict is constructive or we haven't done that and the conflict is destructive. The fourth value is continuous learning. And the story I like to tell here is a few years ago I was asked to do a presentation for the Equine Green Foundation about how we built public allies and I ended up creating something called the worst practices of social entrepreneurship because I figured that there's nothing really valuable they'd learn from our best practices that if I was starting over again, what wouldn't I do? But the first slide in the presentation was called Things I Suck At. And I, I, before sharing our worst practices publicly, I shared it with my staff. And it was kind of terrifying to go up in front of people with a slide, with the people I work with every day with slides that said Things I Suck At and it had a list that included interpersonal conflict, personnel management, patience with process, administrative paperwork, being punctual, small talk, active listening, trusting my instincts, delegating responsibility, making unpopular decisions, and it went on. <laughs> but the thing is, I put this list in front of my staff, and I was terrified. But you know what happened? Everyone started nodding. <laughs> and, and the reason is, the things you suck at aren't a secret. <laughs> Everybody knows it. And you have a choice as a leader. You can either own it, which invites the possibility that you can improve it and talk about it and get feedback on it, or you don't own it, in which people will still talk about it, just not with you. <laughs> and the fifth and final value is integrity. And we look at integrity going back to that notion of the B. It's our fundamental ability to recognize that we, uh, that our mission and our values, that we have to be true to that, and we have to be accountable to those we work with and those we serve, and have the courage of our convictions to speak truth to power, to speak truth to those we work with, and speak truth to, to those we serve. So I think that if we're going to be allied for action, I love that title, we have to be values-based in our leadership, and really recognize that values are an important capacity for our organizations and our leaders.
trusted leadership uh, positions that can learn from uh, your experience of, of admitting all of the weaknesses that we have in front of the people that we serve and that we are working with. Um, I also want to say there were three great messages that you uh, talked about. One is to un unleash leadership from wherever it comes from, make sure the table is set in the right way. Second of all, take responsibility. I mean, we're not going to move anything unless we take our personal and uh, organizational responsibility. And then third, it's live our values, practice our values as deeply as we can. Thank you for that. And now I am so pleased to be joined on the stage by Lori Soroya. Lori is a co-founder and the current president of the Council on American Islamic Relations, Minnesota CARE Min. Through her work with CARE Min, Lori has striven to promote a better understanding of Islam, educate the community and employers about legal rights and religious accommodation, and give a voice to Minnesota Muslims. Please help me welcome Lori this morning. Thank you, Lori. And Lori will be yeah. addressing from the podium. Good morning. So I actually spent my night watching the NPR debate. How many people were able to watch that yesterday? The NPR debate on the um, gay marriage amendment. And so I just have to say this. Um, anytime the word prophecy comes up in a debate about the US Constitution, we have a serious problem. So <laughs> that's all I got out of that debate. Um, so CARE Minnesota is the state's only Muslim civil rights advocacy organization. And we function on a basic premise, and that is that everyone deserves to be treated with respect and dignity. And we're a new organization. We were just founded five years ago. And in those five years, we have resolved over 500 cases of discrimination, hate, and harassment right here in the state of Minnesota. And these incidents that we deal with don't just involve Minnesota Muslims. We also get cases from individuals who are perceived to be Muslim. So that includes Sikhs, Hindus, Arab Christians, and other minorities. So I wanna tell you a little bit about why I do this work. Um, so this picture that you see on the screen is actually my family. And this is what we look like growing up in southern Iowa, of all places. Um, and so we lived in a really small town um, right on the border of Missouri with only 800 people. And because we were the only Muslim family, and in fact the only minority family in town, we were subjected to a lot of hate and bias. The first incident that I remember that involved a hateful act was when I was only six years old. So I'm actually the, one, the serious looking one in the front, if you're wondering which one I am. Um, and so, so I was probably around that age when this incident happened. So we came home, it was a typical day, we were running errands all day. We came home um, and there was an, a message on our answering machine. And for those of you who are young, younger than me, um, you probably don't know what an answering machine is, but it's an actual <laughs> device that was attached to the phone. We didn't have voicemail back then. So we come home and the red light is blinking and my mom hits um, the play button to see who had called and it was a hate message. This person was screaming and swearing at us, just extremely upset. And his main message was that we weren't welcome in this town and that we should leave or else there would be consequences. And the way my mom dealt with this was to quickly delete this message. She told me it was the wrong number. And so of course, even at six years old, my next question was, well, if this is a wrong number, how did he know our name? How did he address us? And why does he hate us so much? You know, I had so many questions that just weren't answered. I refused to believe that it was just a coincidence, just a random prank call, and that something serious had happened but no one was doing anything about it. And so I lived in fear for several months of this person. He knew our name, he knew where we lived, he knew our phone number, and I was worried he would show up to our house and do what he said he was going to do. And so as a six-year-old, the way I dealt with this was to carry around the biggest book I could find. <laughs> it was probably this thick. Um, and that was my shield in case this person showed up. That was the only way I knew how to protect myself. 
but when I got older, um, I realized that fear is not the um, way to solve these issues. You don't change your situation by living in fear. You change it by knowing and asserting your rights. So in a way, this threatening message that I listened to at such an early age is really what motivated me to start Care Minnesota. It was the reason that I went to law school. It was um, what motivates me to this day to do this important work. So 20 years later, you know, you would think that things are a lot better, but unfortunately they're not. Things, especially after 9-11, for the uh, Muslim community in particular, have escalated. There was a recent poll where Americans were asked, what comes to mind when they hear the word Muslim? 32% of Americans made negative comments, and only 2% had something positive to say. So that's alarming, but the good news is that 66% of, of the people had no opinion. And so those are the people that my organization seeks to work with and educate. And these aren't just individuals that we're dealing with. We see bias um, from entities and news media as well. So this slide that you're seeing was actually a news coverage of um, a local mosque open house. This mosque decided they were going to do something proactive and positive and hold this open house and invite their neighbors and you know, serve a meal and really have this dialogue with their neighbors. And this is the headline that our local news channel chose for this meeting. They called it a suicide bomber meeting. And it had nothing to do with suicide bombers. They were actually um, bringing people into their mosque to educate the community. And so my organization, Care Minnesota, has um, identified these six critical issues that are facing Minnesota Muslims. And I'm just going to touch on two of them. Uh, workplace discrimination is really a big issue that we see. 41% of the cases that we get at Care Minnesota are employment discrimination cases. And another issue that we're seeing a real increase in is mosque opposition. We've had four separate mosque oppositions in the state in just the past year. One of them got so serious that the Department of Justice has now stepped in and launched a formal civil rights investigation. And I think what's troubling to me is really who these, who is being targeted by this? You know, on our Care Minnesota Advisory Board, we have a woman who served 13 years in the U.S. Army. We have a volunteer who served in the U.S. Marines. You know, Muslim, they're all Muslim. And so these individuals put their lives at risk for this country, but when they return home, they have to deal with some of this um, misinformation and have their faith, their ability to practice their faith challenged at home. One example of this is the recent anti-Sharia bill. So uh, this actually took place very recently. On March 5th, an anti-Sharia bill was introduced right here in Minnesota, in our Minnesota Senate. And this is a bill, you probably heard of it in the news, it's a statewide campaign where 72 bills have actually been introduced all over the state, all over the nation, by an anti-Islam extremist. And what they basically do is prevent courts from recognizing Muslim marriages, wills, divorces, and contracts, basically outlawing the practice of Islam in that state, and which is a clear violation of the First Amendment. And, but they're still getting passed, they're still getting um, a lot of momentum behind them. But what's so great about Minnesota is that our community and our partners speak up when things like this happen. After an interfaith press conference, and that's the picture that you see, uh, there's probably twice as many people, um, but all couldn't fit in the picture. Um, so we held an interfaith press conference, and three hours after this press conference, the author of the bill withdrew it. And so what's become a court battle that's going to last several years in other states only took three hours to resolve in our state. And it's really led to some positive work. We're now working on a statewide Minnesota anti-hate coalition that's going to address these issues before they come up and not just against Muslims, but against every minority. 
And so how do we solve these problems, specifically in this Muslim community? What we do at CARE is to really help our community define themselves and empower themselves. We organized recently a mock legislature, the first Muslim student mock legislature at the state capitol, and talking about bills that concern them, such as curfew, school nutrition, voter ID. We've organized a um, free legal clinic that's run by Minnesota Muslims. So we are doing these proactive things, but we need your help. I know that many of you get it. You're here working in the nonprofit community, speaking out because you get it. You understand that justice is really what unites us as a community. But we can't function if all members of our community aren't doing okay. And I'll just tell you a quick story. Um, a few weeks ago, I was playing soccer with my, with my little son. Um, he's only two years old, but he's far more athletic <laughs> than I am. Um, and so I, while I was playing soccer with him, I accidentally tripped and hurt my foot. And so I was done for the day. After that incident happened, you know, I re had to reschedule all my afternoon meetings. I went back to bed. I, was, I couldn't function because of this small injury. And so I feel like our community is like that. When one part of our body hurts, it really affects our entire well-being. We cannot function if we're not all doing okay. And so I want to end with a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. And so I ask you today, where do you stand during this time of challenge and controversy? And this is why I'm still doing this work. This is my little boy and my family. Um, so please don't let history keep repeating this, this, um, itself. We've seen this you know, with the Jewish American community, Catholics, Italians, and now it's the Muslim community. I ask that you speak up, that you ask questions, be inclusive, support those that you see that are hurting, and help us create a society where my two-year-old, who is a third-generation American now, doesn't have to deal with this nonsense. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lori. Uh, I'm, I'm missing this side of the, uh, the, the auditorium here, so I think I'll stand up and just say that Lori, what you've talked to us about today is the fact that Minnesota still has deep strategies for discrimination, um, and specifically religious discrimination and religious bigotry. <clears throat> and what you talk to us about is that we have Muslims in our state, in our communities, who are experiencing workplace discrimination, where communities are organizing against opening mosques, and where we've got the bullying and harassment of children. That is absolutely unacceptable. Thank you so much for uh, your comments and for helping us see what's going on in this community. So let me also, before we open it up to the audience, just ask a question here, because we've had three wonderful presentations. Nate, you talked about value and eight elements that will speak to that with um, morality and justice as part of that. Paul, you've talked about unleashing leadership, but also looking at ourselves and seeing not only ourselves as half full, but also the weaknesses that we bring and inviting everybody to the table. Lori, you've talked about the fact that we still have a community that doesn't understand. And in that fear, we are acting against the development and well-being of a whole community. So let me ask this question to each one of you, and I'll start with you, Lori. This is Minnesota. This is Minnesota nice. So we don't like conflict here in Minnesota, and so we act that out in lots of different ways. How can you help us as nonprofits, as foundation leaders, really put issues on the table in a way that we have deep understanding and that can move us to action. Yeah, no, I think I agree. Um, the Minnesota nice concept, I think really 
prevents and prohibits a lot of important dialogue from taking place. Um, you know, I'm from Iowa, I was born and raised there, and so the culture is a little different. You know, I would have people on the street come up to me and ask me, well, why do you wear that thing on your head? You know, what about this? Just, you know, it was just more open. And so I think there is that difference here in Minnesota where people aren't as open as, you know, just asking questions. Even if they look stupid, you know, it's fine. Um, you know, we're more than, you know, welcoming of those um, questions. Thank you. Paul. I, I would say that if you want to gain traction on, on any issue, you have to have space for conflict. And conflict doesn't have to mean that we're disagreeable with each other or that we aren't nice. Uh, I think it just means that we have to speak truth. And I think the moment we're doing the dance where we're not saying what we really think, we devalue whatever we're in. A and I think that if, if we're working in a collaborative, if we're working on a team, if we're working in an organization, uh, again, I think it's one thing to say, uh, if we want to be diverse, if we want to be inclusive, then we have to have space for that difference to actually emerge and be confronted. Nate? Uh, I'll agree with Paul and add to it. Um, I think it's incredibly important to disagree um, because of the complexity of what we're going after, and it's incredibly important that we're not disagreeable with each other. And one of the ways to do that is to attack issues, <coughs> not each other. Why do we attack each other? Usually it's out of ignorance. Um, it's uh, through a lack of understanding of uh, the importance of this diversity. And the one thing I'll add to Lori's comments is that what she spells out is a huge cultural dilemma, a huge cultural issue. You, you located it in history. You're not the first community to experience this. And one way to deal with conflict is to make sure that in addition to the work that we're doing in conflicted arenas, is to make sure that we don't find ourselves solely in those arenas as well. So one of the things that Lori and I were talking about earlier before was cultural fixes in addition to legal fixes. So if you look at what the Cosby Show was to racial relations in the 1990s, that wasn't a story about a black family. That was a story about an American family with a crazy attorney wife and a crazy surgeon father. And we all laughed with that show because we saw ourselves in those characters. Not that they were black, it's that they were American. I think in addition to all the great work that Lori's doing, we all need to create an enveloping culture that breaks down that uh, ignorance. So we look at someone like Lori and say, the fact that you wear a headscarf, the fact that you're you know, Muslim is no big deal. It's really that you're from Iowa, you know, <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, now we can have the audience and we've got a couple of roving mics. And so it's hard for me to see where those roving mics are, uh, but I would invite people to uh, <laughs> ask our speakers questions. We have, uh, do we have any additional questions here? Oh, come on. This is not the shyest group in the world. Go on back there. Okay, we've got a, a question or a comment. We have a question here from Morgan from the Minnesota Fathers and Family Network. Oh, I'm also from a small town in Iowa on the border Sorry. with Missouri. <laughs> Just kidding. Which one is it? Well, we already know the name of it. Um, it's called Bloomfield. Okay. Bloomfield, Iowa. I was, I was in the Corden, Corden area. So oh. we'll, we'll connect later on. Okay. Go Hawks. <laughs> 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 yeah, if you're from Iowa, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. if, you're, if you're from my hometown, I probably know you. <laughs> That's how small it was. And I live on Stoll Avenue in Milwaukee. Yeah. <laughs> other comments, other questions, um, a way to engage in this conversation. Let's start modeling. We've got one. Okay, let's uh, have this question. I'm just trying to see where the person is. Yes, we, go ahead. We have a question from Nancy Kleeman on the board of the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. Just a comment that I think that the Minnesotans United has come up with the idea of conversations, in, which are, has really helped have a lot of people who really differ come together and come to common understandings. 
And just for the record, I want to point out that Nancy actually lives on my block. <laughs> 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 so that's even smaller than a small town. Nancy, I think you're absolutely correct that, you know, what we've done is we've created, it's unfortunate how we got into this space, right? Uh, because that amendment really, I believe, is, I, I have a very cynical view about it. It's not about that public policy. It's about driving politics. It's about driving voters. But it did force a conversation. And one of the silver linings to that amendment is it has forced people to get out of their insular thinking. It got them into conversation with the fact that nearly every one of us knows someone in the GLBT community or knows someone who knows someone in the GLBT community. And through familiarity, we can bring, break down um, this device of insularity and political heat. The one thing I'll add to that is, uh, and this may be controversial, um, I mean, I'm, I'm personally against uh, the amendment. We have the, the sign in our yard. It doesn't matter because our whole neighborhood is orange. But regardless of where that law ends up, the cultural regulation is already being made. What Sesame Street was to my generation, Glee and Modern Family are to this generation on this issue, the law is a lagging indicator the angry politics are there to drive politics. Societally, we're in good shape and we're getting better every day. That's great. <laughs> All right. Next we have, we have Anita from the Mosaic Company. Hi, Lori. I, I actually did listen to the uh, debate last night and one of the things I was struck by was, um, I think it was the bishop's comment from about words that are showstoppers in terms of the conversation. Um, and I wanted to ask the panel, you know, some of the things that you've experienced that have been conversation showstoppers, so to speak. Um, and I do this because given the season of political yard signs, this year I made a decision not to put up political yard signs after I noticed that some of my neighbors on my block didn't talk to me for a year because my signs were different <coughs> from theirs and I thought that that was unproductive. So I'm making an experiment this year and I feel kind of repressed, but I wanted to, <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to hear from you what you think are those conversation showstoppers. I can go first. Um, you know, it's hard to say. Um, so in our yard, we actually have conflicting signs. <laughs> so, you know, and that's okay, you know, cause we don't, as a family, we don't always agree you know, on everything, which is fine. You know, even my extended family, you know, we don't bring up at Thanksgiving politics. Like, that's just the general rule. We just don't bring it up. Um, so, you know, I don't know. That's a difficult question because for me, you know, I'm willing to engage anyone that has questions, um, you know, because I feel like the people that come to me with any kinds of questions, um, they just, they don't know. And I'd rather be that person that answers them and sets them on the right path than have them go and look at, you know, some international incident to help them understand my faith and my culture. Um, so I don't really, I can't really think of an example that would be a showstopper for me. Uh, I had the experience of having Glenn Beck say that I run Marxist re-education camps that train impressionable young people to hate America, distribute needles and condoms, <laughs> help illegal immigrants, and promote a homosexual agenda with federal money. And can, I, can I get the t-shirt concession on we're, that? We're, 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 we're trying to figure out how to fit it on a t-shirt, but the... Uh, acronym. Go with an acronym. But the... the <laughs> You know, it was a, it, that, that experience was a wake-up call to us because we got a lot of, of hate directed at our organization. And, um, uh, and, and I think that what we learned was that also, and I think this is important, and, uh, because this, this little story kind of points out something important, we, we had threats on us. We went to the Secret Service, in fact, with them because this President Obama was on our board, Michelle Obama was an employee for many years, and we got kind of put into that craziness. But what happened is that a gun club put our uh, home addresses of some of our staff on their website and asked their members to spy on us. And uh, we went, we, we contacted with help the, the, the club. And they shut down this, this part of the site that had that, but then sent us this apology. And, and one of the people actually called me and said, I want you to know we're not all like that. And that was some of our more extreme members and I'm embarrassed because of that. And I think the lesson in that for me was 
we somehow, we, we, we like to paint this thing as all red and blue, black and white, however we want to do it. And, and the reality is, at the end of the day, a lot of us are a lot more nuanced than that. Absolutely. And that uh, red state, you know, we get in the political dynamic right now, red states still have, four, you know, four-tenths of people voting blue. Blue states still have, uh, on average, four to f almost five-tenths. I mean, and, and we act like somehow the state that is so-called red, it must be all thinking some way, and the state that's all blue is one way. And the reality is that things are much more mixed than we give it credit for. And we have to build relationships that allow us to really confront these issues together. And, and I think we, you know, again, I think we have to be able to disagree without being disagreeable. Yeah, I would, uh, again, add to that that um, show stoppers usually happen in environments that are built to stop conversation. And that's exactly what the red versus blue conversation has turned into. We have weaponized our civic conversation that way. And as I said earlier, it's to the point where we're solution adverse. You never hear positive economic news out of the US chamber. You never hear positive environmental news out of the Sierra Club. The other thing that I would add to that though, in the yard sign uh, nomenclature, is I think it, it, it's instructive to see how we've changed as well and how we attach ourselves to issues. When I grew up, the bumper said, you know, support our teachers. Now it's, I support teachers. Well, I've automatically put this into a personal adversarial thing that if you don't support teachers, you're not supporting me. The more we attach ourselves to these outcomes, the more we can get into that space if we actually agree on that, that that gun club uh, uh, president was, did not want to be defined by the 10%, the better off we are as a community. We can be actors, we can be spectators. I prefer to hang out with actors and actors who live in nuance. We have some uh, questions up here. I've seen some hands. Can we get a mic up here? Okay. We'll make our way up front. Right, but first, you. we have a question from David Nicholson with the Headwaters Foundation for Justice. Yeah, I was just hoping you'd reflect a little bit. We have uh, amazing leaders in the, in the room today. And I'm just struck by how the changing demographics in Minnesota over the next 10 years is going to usher in a new majority. And how do we think about power and privilege and sharing that, given this new reality of demographics? Go the other way. All right. Uh, demographics are our destiny. And um, you know something? I'm going to attack that issue from a really um, uh, rapacious standpoint, okay? Because I think we all agree, we, I'm pretty confident that we all agree on the, mor the moral and justice side of that, right? Let's uh, focus for a second on the productivity and compensation side. Let's be rap rapacious capitalists for a second, okay? And the idea is if you want to be relevant to a diverse marketplace, you better be diverse yourself. Because you can respond, but if you can't be diverse yourself, there's no way for me to respond to you in a way that's authentic. So if we really want to be a service-oriented society, not just business, not just faith-based, not just nonprofits, but if all of us want to produce value for our communities, that value is being defined by our community. And the more we understand that that community not only has the right to do it, but it doesn't even matter if it did. It's happening and you can play into that, you can move into that, uh, and do it uh, proactively, or you can react to it negatively, and I'm going to bet on the folks who do it uh, in the former, not the latter. Thank you. If the photos on the cover of your annual report and the photo of your staff and board in the back don't look relatively similar, you've got a problem. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and I think that <laughs> w uh, the reason why I talk about it as an action is because I hear a lot of people talk about the ideal and about diversity is something they believe in, but it's something you do. And, and there's a simple pass-fail exam. And, and so I think that any organization today has to look, and I recognize that different communities have different demographics in different, uh, different ways, but that's why I think you have to ask yourself, who is not, what groups are at our table and what groups are we listening to? Are we only listening to uh, the heavy hitters around our board or are we listening to everyone? Are there parts of our community that, are, don't fe that might not feel accessible? It doesn't matter whether we think they f they're accessible, it's whether they feel that we're accessible. Do we take calls from different kinds of leaders 
Do we make calls to different kinds of leaders? Do we seek input actively? I mean, I think there's lots of ways we can look at that, but at the end of the day, uh, it, it really is about what we do, not what we believe. Lori? Well put, um, well put. I would just add to that, in addition to bringing you know, diverse people to the table, I think we also need to address having diverse leaders in our organizations. Because um, I think a lot of times we're so focused on just having them you know, sit at the table. And you know, I get this from, you know, I get asked to be on boards all the time. And it's, I always feel like it's a token position. You know, like, oh, here's this Muslim woman, let's have her be on our board and we'll look diversified, um, look diverse. So, and that's concerning because, um, you know, there are lots of qualified Muslims and, you know, other minorities out there. Um, but there really aren't too many minorities in leadership positions in both corporate sector and the nonprofit sector. So I would urge um, this community to look more at that. Um, my organization trusted me. I was still <coughs> a, a college student. I was actually a senior in college when I started this organization. And so we have a lot of, um, you know, young leaders out there that are very capable of leading organizations. And they just need that trust and that mentorship and guidance from this community. Community. And I will just add a couple of things because it's a, it's a high priority for the Minneapolis Foundation. And that is that we're going to have a tremendous amount of retirements in the next, I'd say in the next five to ten years. What have we done about creating a pipeline that makes sure that diversity is part of that pipeline? Because when organizations come to me, and they often do, it's like, well, what about the Latino community? What about the African American community? What about the Native community, the Asian community? And it's like, well, what about your networks? How have we included different kinds of people with religious backgrounds, with uh, disabilities, with uh, different racial backgrounds in the networks that we oftentimes are connecting with? because it can't just happen at the time that someone has a position open. We have got to be planning for it right now. And if we don't, it's, a fa it's our failure that we're not going to stay relevant to what's happening in our community. So thank you for that question, David. I think it's something that will come up time and time again. Next, we have a question from Jay from MAP for Nonprofits. Um, we're talking about the necessity of being able to have conversations that are around controversial issues and conflict in a healthy way. Um, I've seen how difficult it is, even when it's people face to face, to make that conversation productive and civil. Um, but what I'm really concerned about is the prevalence or the ease now with the kind of communications we have now of putting out anonymous messages of anger and hate. Um, and even when it's not anonymous, when you're communicating with whoever, it's easy to put out an angry message and it's degrading the civility of communication just in society. And how do we deal with that given that we want to have free speech, but yet somehow we need to bring civility to it. It's a huge issue. Um, we have new technology. We tend to weaponize technology before we learn how to figure it out. You know, the first people to capture fire didn't cook you lunch. They put it in your face. And that's what we've done with our mass communications. We have become the media, and you're absolutely right that the anonymity of this media has coarsened the conversation. The first way to address that is to identify it as an issue. The first cure to a disease is to name it. And that's a disease, incivility. It's a cultural issue. Again, we need a cultural fix. How do we fix culture? By acting into it. You act civil. And you start, and you start taking ownership of your language. You know, the day that Lance Armstrong's um, uh, issue broke, there was a ton of Twitter traffic. Most of it generated by retweets. Some of it was really disgusting. Testicular cancer jokes, things like that. And people were retweeting it. People didn't realize that they actually should be thinking that they owned that tweet. Because that's what a retweet is. It's a digital amen. I agree with that, right? And we don't own our language right now. Until we start owning our language, we won't design it for the betterment of all. 
Well, I, I don't believe in anonymous. I mean, I, 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 I write a lot. Uh, and I've seen some of the most horrific comments uh, over time. I don't believe, I, one is I think the news sources, it's irresponsible to allow anonymous comments. I think if people want to say something publicly, they should stand behind it. Um, and, and, and I think that uh, we have to, as a culture, uh, you know, again, as you say, model that civility. I think that, especially in our sector, uh, we have to demonstrate that, that we can bring people together. I think after this election, whichever way it goes, uh, there's going to be a moment, and I think our sector can really lead that moment. Peep, I mean, that, that four-year-old who's crying on YouTube about Bronco, Oba Bronco, Bronco Obama, Obama. And, and, <laughs> and Romney, uh, I think, you know, I think it, it got out there so quickly because that's what people are feeling. And people are hating the polarization, the lies, the ads. And the question is, what's going to fill that void? Because all of a sudden, you know, all those ads are going to go away. People are going to be kind of tired, and, and there's going to be a resol resolution in this election. And the question is, what role can we play to show people that we can bring people together in our communities and in this country to work together productively across difference? And I think there's going to be a hunger for that, uh, whichever way it goes. Yeah. And I would just add that I think it's about a lot of times reframing it. You know, we also see whenever there's a story about Muslims in the media, we always see, you know, the nasty comments. And sometimes it gets so bad that the, um, you know, whether it's the newspaper or TV, they'll actually shut off the comments because it, it just gets so bad. I mean, that's their decision to do that. Um, but I think also um, just reframing it, I think that's what's so important. Um, so many of you probably saw the Newsweek cover called Muslim Rage. And this was after the um, anti-Islam movie um, came out and there was um, some riots abroad. And so there was a, um, a hashtag created on Twitter called Muslim Rage. And it was, it was hilarious. I don't know if anybody followed this. Um, but it was just a lot of Muslims tweeting about what is Muslim Rage to them. Um, and I'll just share two that I thought were really funny. So one young girl, a young woman um, tweeted, having a great hair day and no one even knows about it. <laughs> Muslim rage. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's true, right? Um, I can relate to that. <laughs> and then another uh, mother tweeted, um, my son is named Jihad and I can't yell out his name at the airport. <laughs> so, so they were hilarious. These were some pretty funny um, you know, hashtags, the uh, tweets that we were seeing. So I think if we can reframe it in that way, then we can use it to our advantage. Yes, go ahead. Two really important things that I think you raised, Lori. One is, is that um, we all fail if we allow a vacuum to exist. Ang let's not kid ourselves. We're not going to get rid of bigots, and we're not going to get rid of angry language. What we can get rid of is the vacuum that those folks get to exist in, right? So the more that we lean into those conversations with a better conversation, the better off we are. The other two, uh, thing that I'd like to point out is how important the surgical use of humor is. When we can laugh with each other as opposed to laugh at each other. Humor is an incredibly powerful tool to diffuse anger and to actually point out the absurdity of, of things, right? Unfortunately, we're pretty comfortable about living in anger. We're not as good at living in absurdity, and humor is a great way of pointing that out. So make ourselves laugh more. Next, we have a question from Jeannie Rasmussen with Be Bold Consulting. Good morning, everyone. Uh, two quick things. First off, uh, step back, um, just to let you know that the University of St. Thomas has a multicultural forum on workplace diversity, which is really a wonderful thing to participate in. And since we are nonprofits, um, you can volunteer and be able to attend at no cost. My actual question folds a little bit into this last question, how to utilize social media to promote, you know, civility and gaining um, positive things in the world, but also recognizing the digital divide that not everyone can afford smart technology. And also in greater Minnesota, in rural areas, there may not be cell phone access or high-speed internet to get into that digital area. And just was wondering your viewpoint on that. So thanks. 
Well, I'll start and just say that, that one, as we know with young people, and I, I can't speak to throughout Minnesota's uh, communities, but I know that uh, in small towns and big cities, and we need to extend it to rural areas, that communications, but young people don't even use computers anymore. I mean, they're texting, and, and they're accessing everything from mobile devices. And I do think that as organizations, we do have to think about how to use these, uh, how to use these technologies a lot better. And and one thing is just, if if all the people in this room started like tweeted immediately about the nonprofit jobs issue, it would if 1,300 people tweeted it at once, you would all automatically rise to the top of Twitter, right? And I don't think we're often strategic about how to kind of blast our information, blast our ideas, and, and echo them so that we can really get resonance in the larger culture. And I think, I think we're still too stuck on like press releases as a way to communicate, and we're not thinking enough about how to use blogs, how to use social media, and other things. A and you know, it, that, is what, that is what it is. Anyone, you know, any one of you could create a blog on Huffington Post. And then you could develop your own list of people in your community. You can send it to, and they can tweet it. And then it, I mean, you, there's a different way to broadcast information, and we have to get much better at a, as a sector in how to do that. Yeah, and I would just add that, so there's many people in our communities that don't even have access to social media. I think the immigrant community is one um, area. You know, the Somali community, for example, a lot of their communication is through word of mouth. So whenever my organization, you know, issues something, you know, we'll do the regular tweet, Facebook, you know, press release, um, all of that, but then we have to physically go to the leaders, the elders in that community and relay that message. Um, and so, you know, so I think just knowing those different dynamics of each community are also helpful so your message is getting across. Um, and to your first point that you had mentioned, um, the multicultural forum. Um, so CARE Minnesota um, presents um, a training there every year. Um, so this will be a third year. So it's, I um, just want to say it's a wonderful conference and I hope people will go. And I would add that, you know, it's really important to be literate on technology, but again, focusing on the content of the conversation, so it doesn't matter whether it's in the Twitter view, so it's from, you know, elder to elder. What is the nature of that? And Jeannie, since you, you opened the door, I want to put in a little plug, since we're talking about civil discourse. On uh, November 15th, St. Thomas is sponsoring an event called Freed Speech, uh, evening on civil discourse. Go to stthomas.edu forward slash freed speech. It's going to be a fun crowd, and it's going to be full of these stories of how we can lean into a more civil society. Because as Paul said, after the election, we're going to want to weave ourselves back together. That's exactly right. Do we have one more question, and then we'll wrap up here. So, I'm Mary Jo Wimmer. I have a consulting organization in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. And I'm just reflecting on Paul's use of the... Um, glass half full or half empty. So we can take the stand of being pessimistic and seeing the glass as half empty, which is easy to do. Or we can be optimists and see it as half full and um, maybe miss out on some reality. Or we can be opportunists and while the other two are arguing, we can drink it. <laughs> and I think that's what we need to do um, as members of this society and leaders in nonprofit organizations. Be opportunists. Thank you. It's a great comment. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're going to wrap up here, and I'm going to ask Nate to start. Just uh, give us a couple of words, some words of wisdom that this group, those of us that are in the nonprofit community can take with us as we leave this conversation, but something that we can take action on, something yep. that we can move in the future. Right. Well, this whole conference is about how do you collaborate for those outcomes. So here's my words of wisdom on collaboration. It's actually a few things. One is, in order to collaborate effectively, you have to find someone to collaborate with and you need to agree on the essence of a goal. That's why I laid out those eight things. Those are good goals. You also have to agree that you're going to iterate your way there. There's no perfect way of doing it. There is no silver bullet. What we need is silver buckshot. We need to be patient with each other, and we need to actually fail fast, fail cheaply, and move forward. Drink that glass and keep on going every day. 
Finally, the way to do that is don't be so tied to what you do. Figure out how you do what you do. Your skill sets are what you collaborate with. Don't get shackled by the familiar. Don't get shackled by what you've been doing in the past. This is a world of reinvention. It's time for you to start reinventing as well. Thank you. Paul. We all came to this work because of our values. We all made a choice that we wanted to devote ourselves to others. And so we have to double down on those values today. And we have to recognize that other people took chances on us and took risks on us, and we have to extend those risks and take chances on others. And so we have to dig deeper into our communities, and we have to go back to the values and lead by our values because, as Peter Drucker said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. You can have the great organizational plan, but we have to build cultures that will engage leaders. And I just want to recognize I'm from out of town, but I will be in back uh, with books after the thing in the back. So uh, please feel free to come by if you have other questions for me. But it's been a pleasure to be here in Minnesota. That's great. Lori. Yeah. Um, I think the best way to build bridges with other communities is just dialogue. You know, that word came up a lot, you know, just to get to know another community. So I would really, you know, encourage everyone in this crowd just to commit to getting to know a community that you're not really aware of, that you may not understand, any minority community. Um, I studied abroad in Brazil um, in high school because it was, it was something I had never, you know, learned about. Um, I didn't have any family there. It was just something new. So just even just trying something new. I know traveling is difficult. We were talking about that earlier. Not everyone has that opportunity to travel and learn about other cultures. But we have so many resources right here in Minnesota. So seek those out. Um, Care Minnesota is always a resource for you, and you can definitely feel free to contact us as well. I just want to say thank you so much to our three presenters. And I also, before you start clapping, I want to say thank you so much to this attentive audience who hung in here and were, you were a part of this conversation. I hope you, you are energized by this and you can take it forward as we go and do our work for the next decade. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And there's my... Right, and thank you, Sandy, for leading just a great conversation. It was just perfect what we'd hoped for. I wanted to say three things about our presenters. Uh, Nate Garvis has a new book, uh, Naked Civics. It focuses on harnessing the strengths of our institutions. A lot of the points he made here today. Thank you for bringing that, Nate. Um, Paul Schmitz will be signing his book, uh, Everyone Leads, uh, in the registration area, right out. Uh, yes, so you can buy the book and he'll be signing it. And Lori Soray, there's definitely a book in your future. Uh, <laughs> And we want to read it, so uh, we'll bring you back once you finish the book uh, and finish law school and some other things, I'm sure. Thank you, Sandy, and thank you, panel.